So what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes or so is a bit of reflection on functional programming in general and Haskell in particular. And I'm going to focus on a few things. First of all, we're going to be looking at what you have actually learned in the course. Then we'll move on to thinking about what are the kind of benefits and drawbacks of what you have learned. And then finally, we're going to think about the kind of things that you might want to do if you're interested in taking your Haskell knowledge further. So the first thing I'd like to think about is what have you actually learned in the course? And this is something that I've thought about for quite a while and I've come up with these four bullet points on the slide here. So the first one is the most basic thing, which I hope you've learned in the course, which is how to write simple Haskell programs. And what I mean by a simple Haskell program is perhaps writing one or two pages of code. So it's not very much code, but what I hope you have found in the course is that because Haskell is such a high level and such an expressive language, you can actually do quite a lot in just one or two pages of code. So the second thing I hope you have learned in the course is a new way of thinking about programming. And in particular, it's about thinking in terms of pure mathematical functions. So these are the same kind of functions that you learn about in school. They don't have any side effects. They just simply take an input, process it without interacting with the outside world in any way, and then give an output. So it's a new way of thinking in terms of programming with pure mathematical functions. So the third thing I hope you've learned in the course is about the power of types. So Haskell is a strongly typed uh, language. Types play a very central role. And what I hope you have seen is that once you get your program to be typed correct, it often works first time. And this is something which is not just true of the simple programs which we've been writing in this course. Professional Haskell developers working in industry have the same experience too. It's often the case, once you get your program type correct, then it simply works. And the final thing, which I hope you have learned in the course, is about the power of abstraction. So abstraction is the idea of kind of moving away from low level details and working at a higher level. And we've seen many different ways of kind of abstracting from low level details in the course. So what I'd like to move on to now is thinking about some of the key concepts which have been introduced in the course. And again, I've come up with four of these. So the first one is the idea of saying what we want to compute rather than how we want to compute it. And I've given a simple example of this at the top of the slide. Here, what we have is a Haskell program which is going to sum the squares of the even numbers from a list. And I've written this in a very high level manner as the composition of three functions. So what we're doing on the right hand side is we're first of all filtering out the even numbers from a list. Then in the middle, we're mapping the squaring function over the resulting numbers. And then finally on the left, we're going to sum all of the remaining numbers. And again, the emphasis here is on saying what we want to compute rather than the low-level details of how we want to compute it. And it's interesting to compare with how you might write something like this in a more traditional imperative style, maybe using a loop. So this is a much more high-level way that we've expressed it here as the composition of three functions. And again, there's an important point here, which I've emphasized many times in the course. Some of you may look at this program and worry about efficiency, but I've tried to emphasize many times in the course, don't worry about efficiency. Write clear, concise, correct code and let the compiler worry about translating it down to something that could be executed efficiently on the machine. So the second concept at the bottom of the slide here is the idea of separating pure and impure code. And this is something where the type system of Haskell really helps you a lot. So you can ask yourself, what's the difference between the two function types at the bottom of the slide? On the left hand side, we have int arrow bool, and on the right hand side, we have int arrow io of bool. And the difference is that the functions on the left are pure mathematical functions. They just take an integer and deliver a boolean and do nothing else. 
whereas functions of type int to io of bool also take an integer and deliver a boolean, but behind the scenes, because we have the io tag on the return type, this function may also do io, may interact with the outside world. So again, the idea of the type system helping us to separate the pure world of mathematical functions from the impure world of functions that may interact with the outside world. So the next concept I'd like to think about is the idea of functions being first class citizens. And this simply means that you can do the same kind of thing with functions as you can do with any other basic data type in the language. So for example, you can pass functions as inputs to other functions and you can return functions as outputs from other functions. So I've given a simple example of this at the top of the slide. Here's our old friend, the map function. And what map does is it takes a function from A to B and then it takes a list of A things and then it's going to give you back a list of B things by applying the function all the way across the input list. And what map does is it captures a common pattern of processing a list where you want to do the same thing to each element in the list. And what Haskell allows you to do, because functions are first class, is you can abstract out this pattern into a general purpose function such as map, where the first parameter, the function a to b, tells you what to do with each element of the input list. So the final concept on the slide here is one that we didn't really touch upon too much in the course, but it's something which is very important in a pure language such as Haskell, and it's the idea of equational reasoning about programs. So what I've given you is a simple example of this in the two blue boxes at the bottom. These are two functions which are equal, and what you see on the left-hand side is we're doing two maps, and on the right-hand side we're doing a single map. So on the left hand side, we're mapping a function g across an input list, and then that's going to give us a new list. And then separately, we're then going to map the function f over each element of that list. What we have on the right hand side is an equivalent but slightly simpler way of doing the same thing. We're simply mapping the composite function f composed g across a list. So these two ways of mapping are actually equivalent. If you give these two functions an input list, they will always give you the same result. And this is something which you could prove to be true in a pure functional language such as Haskell. But then you might think, well, you're a Haskell programmer, or you're a programmer, you're not a mathematician, why should you care about these kind of equational properties? But you can probably guess these often have something to do with efficiency. The blue box on the left does two maps, that maybe take a bit of time. The blue box on the right does a single map, maybe that can be more efficient. So again, we didn't really touch upon equational reasoning too much in this course, but being able to write down properties like this about your programs is one of the key benefits of pure functional languages such as Haskell. So this brings us on now to the issue of drawbacks. As you probably noticed in the course, I'm a big fan of programming in the functional style, and I like to teach you about all the kind of nice features that a language such as Haskell provides you. But of course, there are some drawbacks, there are some negatives. So I'd like to kind of spend a minute or two talking you through what I think are the key or main drawbacks of the approach. So the first one is that it can be difficult to reason about the efficiency of Haskell programs. And the reason for this is that in a language like Haskell, it's quite clear what your programs mean in terms of pure mathematical functions, but it's perhaps not so clear what your programs actually do in terms of how they interact with the hardware, how they interact with the memory, and so on. And this is kind of in contrast to more low-level languages, such as C, for example. So when you write a C program, it's quite clear what your program does in terms of how it interacts with the memory and so on, but it's perhaps not so clear what your program means in terms of pure mathematical functions. So Haskell is a very high-level language, and um, it's quite far from the hardware, it's far from the metal, and one of the drawbacks um, that results from this is that it can be more difficult to reason about low-level issues, such as how efficient or performant your programs are. So the second of the main drawbacks, which I would identify, is that there are, is perhaps 
uh, more limited to support for developers. So if you are a Java programmer, for example, you're quite used to having a whole spectrum of possible tools available, often developed by large companies with lots of, lots of support. Um, Haskell does have tool support for developers, but the tools which are available tend to be uh, kind of not quite as well developed, maybe not supported by large companies. So I would identify this as being kind of one of the, one of the drawbacks of programming in Haskell. You don't have so much tool support to help you when you're writing your programs. And the last of the drawbacks here at the bottom of the slide is probably something that many of you have kind of thought about um, for yourselves in the course. Thinking in Haskell requires the ability to think abstractly. I mean, typically you need to kind of think quite deeply and only then, once you've kind of understood the problem you're trying to solve, do you actually type uh, stuff in at the keyboard. So it's kind of think first, type later. And again, this is in contrast to some more traditional languages where maybe you can start getting things kind of half working quite quickly and then improve them towards a solution. In Haskell, you tend to kind of need to think quite deeply up front, think what are my algorithms, what are my data structures. So you think first quite hard and then only then do you actually start writing your actual program because you need to think more abstractly. And this is something which comes very naturally to some people, but not everybody. So I think for me, this is one of the, the main drawbacks of Haskell. It requires the ability to think, think abstractly, which doesn't come particularly easily to some people. So to wrap things up today, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about how you might take things further if, you, if you've enjoyed the functional programming part of the module. So first of all, in second year, I teach an optional module called Advanced Functional Programming, which builds on this course. And in this module, I cover two things. I cover monads, which is Haskell's approach to reasoning about effects. And I cover reasoning about programs, which is applying mathematical techniques to prove properties of your programs, which is not something which we covered in this introductory module. In terms of other languages, even if you never write a Haskell program again, which I hope that many of you will, the ideas which you have been learning about in this course are filtering their way through to many other mainstream languages. So for example, Java now has Lambda expressions and some form of pattern matching, both of which are ideas which originated in functional languages such as Haskell, whereas Python also has Lambda expressions these days and has list comprehensions, which is something which comes directly from languages such as Haskell. So the point here is that even though some of you may not write any Haskell programs again in the future, all of you will be using the kind of ideas about pure functional programming, which I've been teaching you in this course. So the third point here is something which has changed in recent years. I've been teaching Haskell in Nottingham for many, many years. When I first started teaching the subject, there wasn't really very many industry jobs, but that has changed these days. There are interesting and often quite highly paid jobs in functional programming. So um, the kind of jobs you can get in this is it's really kind of two groups of companies that are interested in hiring Haskell people. Um, the kind of top of the market, some of the kind of leading players such as Google, Facebook or Meta and Amazon, these are very interested in hiring functional programming people. So are a number of startups. So if you see some startups, particularly in some of the big cities such as London, um, they will often mention Haskell as a desirable quality. So if you've taken the functional programming course with me, and particularly if you do the advanced functional programming course in the second year, if you find this kind of stuff interesting, there is a possibility that you can get an interesting job in industry once you graduate. And finally, down at the bottom here, um, this is quite a way off for you if you're a first year student taking the, the Programming Paradigms course with us. But in the future, you might like to think, are you interested in doing a PhD in this area? And we have a functional programming group in the School of Computer Science in Nottingham. The group has been running for many, many years. We have graduated over 30 PhD students over the years. And if you're interested in this, when you come into your third year or your fourth year, come and talk to me or any of the other academics in the functional programming lab in the school, and we'll be very happy to talk to you about opportunities for PhD positions in this area.